Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to Real Abilities. This is our second to last night of the festival. Um, uh, tomorrow night is closing night, sold out show. Um, and it's been an amazing week. I want to thank all of our audiences for being a part of this. Um, beyond everything else that's been wonderful about this film festival this year, um, one thing I've been hearing more and more from our audiences, and I'm patting ourselves on the back here, I'm um, actually, we have nothing to do with it except for the fact that we chose these amazing films. The quality of the films are amazing. And this year we actually for the first time included more feature films than documentary films. And that, that when you think about it, that means something, think about the budgets of these two kinds of um, films. It's, it really means um, a higher quality of production. Um, and almost all of the feature narratives included authentic portrayals, and this goes for the shorts too, included authentic portrayals, meaning actors with disabilities. And this is an amazing feat, and I want to thank our selection committee for that, and all of you for supporting this. Um, and I challenge you, these films were, were so great. I mean, that um, if you've seen, who here has seen other films in the festival this year? I mean, thank you. There should be more hands up. And this includes tonight's film, too, that you're going to see a little more, uh, that you're going to see a little bit later. Um, but I challenge you to find a festival showing as solid films. Um, a View from Tall, which is the film that we're showing, The View from Tall that we're showing a little bit later, is, um, is a prime example of inclusivity and quality both coming together. We can do this. Um, they did it right. Um, disability in this film is not the drama but just a layer of depth that adds to the drama and the humanity within the story. Um, here at Real Abilities, we are not just a film festival. We started this thinking, we're, hey, another film festival in town. Um, but um, we actually very quickly became part of a movement, and we help create a more diverse and a more inclusive, more diverse and more inclusive images um, on film and television. And this is something that we need to see absolutely everywhere, not only in disability film festivals. Um, we also hope that these visions will then trickle down, trickle down to the world and, um, and our community um, so the change can happen actually also not only um, in the film world but every, for everyone who watches films. Uh, Danny Woodburn, who's sitting up here heckling me, um, is, uh, told us at opening night to speak up and to make some noise and, um, and I'm going to admit here that this is an uphill battle um, but we're ready to make some noise and um, we're here tonight um, um, with a, an amazing panel that's going to talk about some of the good examples and how, like tonight's film, how this can be done, how we can make high quality, inclusive films and TV projects. Um, We've all heard before that we need more inclusion in Hollywood, um, but um, I, think, um, I think we're ready to take it to the next level, and I think we're ready to start a revolution and start um, taking films, like all the films that have been in this festival, and putting them into, bringing them to the mainstream. Um, I want to thank just a few partners for tonight that made it possible. First of all, um, our partnering um, organization that's, um, that's, that's really put this event together, SAG-AFTRA. Um, <laughs> specifically, Adam Moore and Becky Curran there, who have been wonderful partners for years. Um, inclusion in the Arts, which we'll hear about more in a second. I want to thank the Ruderman Family Foundation um, and uh, highlight their TV challenge, which, uh, Danny, we want to hear more about from, about from you um, uh, a little bit later in the program. Um, and finally, somebody who just possibly snuck out, but uh, I saw Rachel Winter walking by. Rachel Winter has been a huge supporter for this program, and I want to thank her for that. I want to thank... Thank you. I want to thank um, all the participants who are going to be on this panel in just a moment. I'm, I'm uh, looking at empty chairs right now. Um, and all of everybody who's been speaking up this week and are, have, have been with us um, here throughout the week and are ready to make some noise with us. Um, and one of the people who's actually been leading this revolution, um, one of our partners, Inclusion in the Arts, um, she's representing that. Um, I would like to invite Christine Bruno. Um, she's from SAG after it well, as well. And she's the New York Loco PWD Committee Chair and Alliance from Inclusion in the Arts. Thank you, Christine. Today, 
today. We're going to shake things up. So, yeah. So thank you all for being here. I just want to take a moment to look around the room and say, oh, my God, we're almost full. So that's awesome. Thank you. And it's so amazing that we all get to be here together, surrounded by our incredibly talented and engaged peers in the audience and backstage who you'll meet in a moment. That includes industry decision makers, activists, artists, and audiences. We're celebrating each other, our lives, and our work. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So like Itzy said, my name is Christine Bruno, and I have the great fortune to welcome you all here tonight to the first ever Real Abilities Industry Night. So tonight, I'm wearing a few different hats. As those of you who know me know is pretty par for the course, I'm here as a, a performer, a proud member of SAG-AFTRA and Actors' Equity, and another as the chair of the New York Local Performers with Disabilities Committee for SAG-AFTRA, and last but not least, as disability advocate for inclusion in the arts. We are celebrating our 30th year as the nation's leading arts advocacy organization, promoting the full inclusion of disabled performers and artists of color in American arts and entertainment. So I have a few remarks here, and I want to, I'm probably going to jump around because I really want to get to our amazing panel. What we're going to talk about tonight is what's happening in the industry right now and what each of these amazing people is doing to disrupt the status quo and how each of us can have an impact that leads to greater inclusion of disabled performers in front of the camera, which is why we're here tonight. Tonight we're going to take a look at how the work gets done and what you can do to ensure that what we all can do to ensure that our voices, our faces, our bodies, and our stories are heard, seen, and told throughout entertainment and news media accurately authentically, as Isaac mentioned, and more often. As the current chair of SAG-AFTRA's New York Local Performers with Disabilities Committee, I am especially proud to serve the membership and to say that our union put out the following powerful statement last year. SAG-AFTRA members work in the most visible workplace on the planet. And we will continue to use this visibility to shine a light on the inequity that still exists throughout all levels of the entertainment and news media in terms of opportunity, treatment, and compensation. So that is our charge. And we're fortunate to do it with the full support of our union, SAG-AFTRA, and the continued work of our partners at the Ruderman Family Foundation, the Real Abilities Film Festival, and Inclusion in the Arts. So those are, that's our housekeeping. We want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions for the panelists and for the amazing film we're going to see tonight, A View from Tall. But before we dive in, Becky, can you bring out the panel? Because this next thing I'm going to say is not going to make sense unless you're all out here. <laughs> so I'm going to give a second for our amazing panel to come out. <laughs> Are we sitting just randomly? You know, you can sit. I don't know. Ask Becky. Becky's the moderator, so if she's got a particular. This is, you know, this is how we shake things up. We didn't actually talk about this, so this is an example of shaking things up. So, okay, so you're going to see in two. Jack, Becky's going to introduce everybody in just a second. But before we dive into the panel, I want to throw something out there. Take a good look at the composition of this panel. Just, I'm just throwing it out here just to make sure we're all on the same page tonight. So let's take a second to address the white elephant, and I use the word white very deliberately, in the room tonight. I think it's important to acknowledge up front so we can listen to the conversation that we're going to hear in the most productive way without getting our heads all in a spin about what we don't see up here. So, okay, so here it goes. It's pretty damn white up there, right? And and disability. I said, well, that's why token. I said pretty. I'm the token, right? Yes. And and disability is is about more than just mobility, right? So there, I said it. We don't know if anyone up here has an invisible disability, but 
you know, we, we can see that we're not adequately representing the full diversity of either race and ethnicity or disability. So here's the bad news. When we take on a topic as broad as this one with a community as diverse as this one, it isn't always possible to cover every issue from every perspective and lived experience, no matter how hard we try. And we try. <laughs> but the good news is we are aware of it and making sure that we stay mindful of intersectionality in everything that we do. Happily, a lot of us are working right now and couldn't be here tonight. So that's the best news. So with that said, and the elephant is, is leaving the room, or maybe he's shrunk a little, I don't know. <laughs> so, so tonight is about us, professionals and aspiring professionals learning from one another. Tonight, we get to hear from our amazing colleagues who are forging paths and making noise doing it. So let's make some noise. Let's sh shake things up. Yes, yes. So it might get a little messy. So remember that we're all family in this room and we all want the same thing. More inclusion of disabled artists in the industry, right? Woo! <laughs> But before we get started, I want to extend a huge thanks to Isaac Zablocki and Ravi Torjiman for Real, from Real Abilities for their dedicated support of tonight's event and for the past several years. What is this? Is this eight? Is this eight or nine? Nine, right? So this is the ninth year of Real Abilities. So everybody keep giving them a hand. And I also want to do a special shout out to everybody who helped make tonight happen. There are too many names to mention, but they, knew who, but they know who they are, so thank you. Nobody was more instrumental to this collaborative, to collaborative effort than tonight's moderator, Becky Curran, <laughs> from SAG-AFTRA's EEO and Diversity Department. As an expert and advocate on a global scale, Becky brings to her creative, her, she brings her creative, administrative, and industry savvy on behalf of artists on camera and behind the mic every day. Enough of listening to me talk. It's my amazing pleasure to turn this mic over to my colleague and friend, that mic, my colleague and friend, Becky Curran. <laughs> Hi. Hello. The sun. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And more importantly, thanks to our amazing panel for being here today. I'm just going to quickly introduce myself and give you some context about this panel. And then I'm going to introduce the panelists as I ask them their individual question that I have for each of them. And then we will turn it over to the audience for questions. And hopefully the panelists can also think of some takeaways that we have for the audience and how they can help with more inclusion in the industry and of performers and people with disabilities in society. I want everyone to think of today as a graduate course. We've been having these conversations for decades and we want to take it to the next level. We really want people to come at the end of this, something, bring something to their workplace that they can put into action tomorrow. We need more inclusivity across the board. So about me quickly, I've uh, worked in the industry for about a decade. I worked at a talent agency, a creative artist agency, and about four years in, I decided to put together a panel similar to this where it was representation of disability in the media because people continued to tell me at the agency that people with disabilities, performers with disabilities, artists with disabilities don't exist. And it clo hits close to home because as a little person, there are only 30,000 of us in the United States. And that means that most people, when they see a portrayal of a little person, it's in the television, media, film industry. Whatever people see, that affects how they treat us. And there's proven facts. There was a study that was actually done that when you engage with authentic stories, people are more likely to be more inclusive in real life. 
and we need to understand that importance and make sure that it's instilled in the work that we do every day because it affects how people are treated. Whether they decide to live another day, as deep as that may be, even with little people, most little people are born to average height parents. So the moment a parent is told that they're having a little person child in the delivery room, it's them, their decision to decide whether they want to keep the child. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't end up keeping their child because they fear the future of their child. So this is really why I'm passionate about this work and why these conversations are so important. And we need to make sure that we continue to increase authentic portrayals of disability across the board, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the scenes. So I want to get to the beginning of this conversation and start off with the producer of the film that we will be lucky enough to see at the end of this panel, The View from Tall. And what is so amazing about that film is it was originally written for anyone, the role that Christopher, Michael Patrick Thornton plays was written for any person, any performer. And it's so amazing because disability is only referenced once in the film. The middle of the film, he tells the character that he is the therapist for that he's thankful that she didn't mention his disability. And that's the only time it's referenced. That's something that we all aspire to be a part of. Can, Mary, can you tell us about that process? And Mary is a member of SAG-AFTRA and a producer. She's one of those great examples of being out there creating her own content. She didn't see enough positive content out there, so she got out there and continues to create as she pursues her entertainment career. Tell us a little bit about the project and how it came about and how you guys found Michael Patrick Th Thornton for that role. Sure. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. This is awesome to see so many people here interested. And um, it's just really heartwarming. So thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, so The View from Tall started out as a play. And in that play, there were only three people, uh, the three main characters, Justine, Douglas, and her sister, Paula. And Caitlin and Erica, the co-directors of the film, were looking to mount the play in a professional production uh, in Chicago. And they were huge fans of the Gift Theater, which is a wonderful theater up on the north side uh, of Chicago. And Michael Patrick Thornton is the artistic director there. And so they did a, a reading of the play. And Michael uh, read the role of Douglas. And it was, as I understand it, like a light bulb went off. It was his reading of the role was a revelation. And he was just so genuine and brought so much depth and humor to the role that they thought, well, why not cast him? He's amazing. And you know, he really um, is a wonderful scene partner. He listens like nobody else. He gives so much to the perform. He gave so much to the performance, which you'll see in the film. Additionally, him being in a wheelchair, um, you know, brought another unexpected surprise to this rom this romance that unfolds, and and that was a wonderful. Um, added element, benefit, because it is an unexpected thing that happens in the, in the play and subsequently in the movie. So um, yeah, that's how, that's how that all came about. That's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Next, I want to ask award-winning performer, screenwriter, teacher, and theater director, William H. Macy, how has it been? <laughs> How, like, what brings you here today? What, how has cerebral palsy affected your life? I know you played and co-wrote Door to Door on TNT, where you played a performer with a character with cerebral palsy, and I know you also had a role in the film The Sessions. How do you feel connected to the disability community, and 
what do you think you'll continue to do to educate people about the community and the talent that exists in the community? Um, the, um, the idea of uh, making a film about Bill Porter, who was a door-to-door -door salesman in Oregon, he was born with cerebral palsy and was deemed unemployable. And uh, uh, I'll cut to the chase. They finally stopped keeping records at the company where he worked because he just buried the competition. <laughs> and um, I met Bill. And uh, anybody who did was swept away by his, his it's, it's not courage. I kept saying, uh, that's not the right word. He kept saying, well, I had to pay the rent. It wasn't courage, I had to pay the rent. And uh, his, his good humor, his positive attitude, his um, love of his job and of people, it was just infectious. And, um, the film was wildly successful, and um, there was a screening for UCP, and I said, well, if there's any, ever anything I can do, which is not the right thing to say. <laughs> That's not a good phrase to say around, uh, and yes. <laughs> so I became what they call the um, ambassador for United Cerebral Palsy for about three or four years, and, um, I met a lot of people, and they're all extraordinary. And um, um, I did a film called The Sessions, uh, which was also incredibly moving. And uh, I think that's what brings me here this evening. And uh, my, my, particular, um, my particular angle on this is that it's an untapped market, and it's about time we you know, I'm all about selling tickets, I'll be honest with you. And uh, I think this is an untapped market, and I think there, is, there are great actors out there, and uh, we could do some good. It's going to take a little bit of work, and as a writer, I know this. When you write something, everybody looks just like you mm. on the first pass. And um, it takes an act of will to stop and say, does it have to be... Uh, a white guy? What, what if it were a woman? What if it were a Hispanic woman? What if it were a black guy in a wheelchair? What does it have to be? And when you really ask yourself those questions, you open up uh, the whole world. And um, I've been trying to do that ever since. And uh, this comes at the time when my industry has just been completely lambasted by turning out all these films that look just like me and not like the audience that we're trying to reach. And uh, there's a lot of work being going on, a lot of proactive work for inclusion so that our films look like our audience. And uh, God bless our industry. It's going to happen fast because they're serious about it. That's what brings me here. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of serious about it, I have played the role of well, I have worked in the role of casting, and I know how challenging that is to try to convince a writer that they really mean something else when on paper it says average white person. So in your role of casting, John Ort, Marcy Phillips. Marcy Phillips is the executive director of ABC Casting. And John used to work at ABC Casting, and now he does independent casting. What do you do to convince people that they're wrong when they try to assume that a performer who you really believe in has the potential beyond what their expectations are? And how do you really work with those actors to get them prepared? And what do people need to do to be prepared to be seen and be taken seriously? I know it's a lot in one, but I, it's kind of all encompassing of how can we work towards greater levels of inclusion at the level of casting? And how can we all be allies so we can convince the writers, creators, that maybe they mean something else. Maybe they should take a chance. Um, <clears throat> well, something that you know, I know uh, 
from years at ABC that we always did and, and what I continue to try to do now is, um, you know, talent is talent and, and bring in diversity, uh, you know, for all, for any role um, and show the producers, you know, a lot of, a lot of different ways to go um, as you start casting so that, you know, you hope that it does, uh, you know, open up their mind and, and see that exactly, it doesn't have to be the white guy that you put on the page um, that, you know, uh, that we can open open it up um, and 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 you know specifically um, you know working with Christine when working with actors with disabilities you know uh, to not wait for that not necessarily you know not wait for that role to be in front of us um, you know that that's been written specifically and and sit back and wait for that to come up to you know right from the start. Um, open up our minds and say, okay, you know, I, I see, I see what you wrote and I see the idea of this world, but I want to, you know, I want to give you, uh, you know, I want to open up your mind. I want you to, to look at this world in, in other ways. Um, and, and, and bring in people with that, with that thought. The thing is we, we as casting directors aren't as powerful as you would think. <laughs> um, you know, all we can do is present things to people and say, you know, open up your vision. Um, and we've been successful pretty much at ABC. I mean, I don't want to be here like thumping ABC, but you know, we we make it a point um, to be as inclusive as possible, and we can always get better and better and better. But um, all we can do is present it and say open up your minds and you can't you can't convince somebody that doesn't want to be convinced but um, just this year alone um, we we did get somebody um, who's a phenomenal actress who's a wheelchair actress um, and she's um, she's in a role that was just meant for again just anybody um, and so but the producers were, open to it. So I think the most important thing for you as performers is to, uh, first of all, work on your craft and be better tomorrow than you work, than you are today, because that goes for every actor. I think it's, um, it's crucial to be undeniable, because I feel like if you give somebody an excuse not to hire you, they'll take it. So you have to always be working on your craft and show them that you're a great actor. and that's going to, I think that that's gonna do wonders, wonders for the community. Um, and I think it's also very important to write your own content. You know, everybody has a story, everybody has a story. So if you don't see something out there that, that works for you, if you feel that the universe isn't providing for you, you make it happen. You know, I, I tell that to all actors. You know, some actors say, well, I'm not a writer. Well, did you, have you ever tried? You know, we need, we need everyone um, to be diverse in terms of producers. We need diversity in every aspect of this business. It's not just going to be being an actor and knocking on a door because every actor comes crying to me, I, I, you know, every single day about this. So it's you need to take the reins and you need to be more proactive and open up your artistic palette and say, maybe I can write, maybe I can be a producer, maybe I can, and, and try that. Thank you, and I commend you for the work that you do with the ABC Showcase. There have been a lot of great opportunities that have come from the ABC Diversity Showcase, which has been historically known for including performers with disabilities and it's important to get yourself out there. Just quickly, when I was working in casting, I read a script and there was a role for someone who was two inches taller than a little person. And I tried to ask my bosses if they would talk to the writers to try to convince them that this role was meant to be for a little person because there was a dynamic conversation about this guy making fun of his friend for making friends with the short person. So it was a conversation that's so realistic. It happens to us all the time. And if they could have just 
been convinced to just have a little person actor. Fa fast forward about six weeks, the day before the table read, they come to me and ask, do you think we should try to go find a little person? <laughs> and I found it kind of insulting because if we didn't have, if, if we didn't at least try to have the conversation early on, we wouldn't have been at that point. And the show ended up not going on, but it's important, I think, for us, just from the creative perspective, to at least voice our opinions about something we really believe in. To me, the very hopeful thing is that every year it gets better and better. I mean, you know, obviously not fast enough for anybody, but people's perception is opening and um, I'm very, very, very optimistic about what the future is gonna hold because every year I do, every year I see the minds are open a little bit more, so it's good. Speak <laughs> Speaking of better and better opportunities, RJ, everyone knows him from Breaking Bad. Uh, <laughs> And we all know the great story of Breaking Bad that the creator grew up with someone in his life who had cerebral palsy, and then he wrote in that character, as Bill was saying, it really is based on your life experiences. That's what you're gonna write about. So I wanna know, since that was such a great launching pad for your career, what have you been up to since then? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, you know, Breaking Bad gave me a career. I, I wouldn't be in this industry at all if it wasn't for Breaking, for breaking Bad. It's, it's way too much nonsense that goes into this, this business. Uh, but, but I, I still love it somewhere down deep inside. And, uh, and, it, you know, I, I'm very lucky in my career because I, I, I work every day. I'm, I'm very broad in my work. I, if you're in this industry, I'll tell you right now, as an actor, it doesn't just stop at acting. You gotta be a businessman. You gotta be a woman. Uh, you know, you got not, not specific, uh, gender, uh, gender specific. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm very lucky. I do about three movies a year. You don't always see them, but I do them. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I, I'm very lucky for that. I, uh, I do a lot of work with philanthropic industries, nonprofit. And what's interesting is what uh, Mr. Macy said, you know, this is an untapped market. I, I do a lot of work with corporations and companies and different organizations that actually have real numbers. And the disability market is a $2.5 billion industry that is not being used. They're using about a billion dollars worth of that uh, right now, just as we speak. But there's another 2.5 billion that is untapped, that is there to be utilized and to grow with, and and people are forgetting that. Uh, but but I've been lucky enough I capitalize, <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. But uh, but I, I again I shoot about three movies a year. I have a movie, uh, a couple movies coming out, a few on Netflix, and and the thing is is create your own work, create your own content. What you said at the end of the day. What, what are we doing now in this media? We're writing stories, we're putting it online, we're creating new media. Tell me what a network is. Think about what a network is, actually. A network, take away all the CEOs, all the people that are involved, all the bullshit that goes into making a network. It's a URL, it is an online, it's a YouTube. That literally is what a network is. You have every right to create a content and put it on something that you feel passionate about. And now more than ever, we have access. You know where to find cameras. You have a camera that you carry every single day. It's on your phone. They just shot a movie that was all on an iPhone. It won awards. Like, like you have movies that are shot on million dollar budgets that never see the light of day, let alone winning awards for an iPhone film. Like, think about that. You have the ability, and it's a beautiful market. You know, we, we have so many people that are in this industry that create real content, that don't really see things, but they create it. And you have every right to be right there with them and utilize that market and grow with that market. And I've been lucky to do that. I, I have meetings apart from what we were doing earlier today. Um, I was w with my um, Perspectiva friends and uh, my, my Russian exchange people. Hello, yeah. Yeah, man, yeah. Uh, 
And we were running around, and even then, I still fit in like three business meetings and found it in, in different organizations. Fit as much as you can in. It doesn't just start and stop with the industry. It goes on a ground level. It goes back to business and corporations and industries that necessarily you wouldn't think are affiliated with film and television, but they are. And they want to fund your projects. They want to be a part of what you're doing. And, and so don't, as broad-minded as we are in this disability community, in ourselves we can be small-minded. And that just, just like everyone else. So, so don't be afraid to step out and to reach out to people you don't think want to be involved. Because they do. Everyone wants to be famous. Everyone, everyone wants to be in this industry. We all have these dreams and these admirations to, to work in film and television. So, so do so and create. Um, you know, not every show is going to be a Breaking Bad. What Breaking Bad did was gave me a platform. They didn't highlight my disability. They didn't highlight me. Challenge, my challenges with cerebral palsy. They showed a real family. They showed truth and honesty in film and television. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what we're truly hungry for, is honesty. And that will carry over. If you are truly honest with who you are and what you want to represent, it will carry you farther than trying to fight and beat down doors. So remember at the end of the, at the, end of the day, to don't, don't rush, don't push. We, we can, we're, we're pushing for you. There's enough, there's enough. Me and Becky, we, we know, man. <laughs> we were just talking. <laughs> we were a decade. Asking, oh, God, it's, it's been a decade that we've been working. I can't believe this. I, I started working <laughs> with these amazing men and women uh, when I was around 14 uh, 15, 14 years old, really, 15 years old, and I've seen amazing progress. We still have a long way to go, but people are fighting for you. So be prepared when they are done fighting and the opportunity is there to seize it. Because in this industry, it's all about when readiness meets opportunity. And if you are ready, but you are, n if you're ready and you don't have the opportunity, you're, you're going to get impatient, and you're going to have the opportunity, and you might not be ready, and that's not going to work. So be prepared for when these opportunities come to you to not be afraid, not to rush it, not to try, to try and, and force something, but to be who you truly are, because that's what they hire. They, don't hi they, they hire me because of who I am and, and, and what I try to represent, even though I pretend to be a good actor. They they don't always they don't always <laughs> see that. It's it's kind of a numbers game, and and they they want that that representation, and they want you. So so be careful of rushing, but but love what you're doing, and and that's what we do. That's what we're here to yes. do. Yes, thank you. That's it. <laughs> Speaking of tricking everyone. No, I have one. Thank you. <laughs> May soon, Zayed. Had the number one TED Talk in 2014. And she's rocking it by creating her own content. There will actually be a series based on her life story. And we want to know about it. We want to know what you do to fight towards greater levels of inclusion. A big thing that Christine mentioned is we can't just have white people with disabilities. We have to make sure there's an intersectionality and may soon is brave and fights hard every single day to make sure that inclusion is represented. And if she wants something done, she tells people that it's <laughs> going to be done, rather than having the fear uh, and just letting people walk all over her. She's not going to let it happen. So tell us about that. So I kind of feel like you left me in the end so that I could be the devil, because um, I'm going to rain on everybody's parade. But first and foremost, I am so sorry about everything I'm about to say, William H. Macy, because I love you so much as an actor. I love you so much as an actor. I totally want to work with you. But, 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 <laughs> by round of applause, who actually knows who I am in this room? So, for the past 20 years, my manifesto has been that visibly disabled roles must be played by visibly disabled actors. And I, I'm not 
because I love you so much, this is painful, but I'm going to talk about why. And the reason I fought for this my entire life is because I truly believe that visible disability, much like race, cannot be played. And that when people attempt to act, three different things are happening. One is there was this great research done by the Rudderman Foundation called the Annenberg Report. And what they found out was the limited images of disability on TV are 95% are played by non-disabled actors. So first and foremost, we're not getting the opportunities. Second of all, I think that beautiful performances can be done. But for me, someone living with a physical disability, I just don't think that physical disability is a bunch of physical actions. I think it's so much more than that. So when I think that people have great intentions, I also think that sometimes the community watches it from a different perspective, feeling like that's not me. And one of the things I worried about growing up was the fact that I did have positive images of disability. I had Jerry Jewell. I had Radar on MASH. I had Chris Burke on Life Goes On. I did have images. I had Richard Pryor, which was like one of the strongest images for me, someone who shakes all the time, to see a person of color like me who also shook all the time. But I always worried about these kids that were watching these images of disability on the screen, like Claire Danes' Temple Grandin or Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot, and then saw those people waltzing down the red carpet completely healed and felt yeah. like that can't be me because I can't waltz down the red carpet. So the biggest like draw of my work is to piggyback what everyone said. You got to be talented. I don't care if you're disabled and the role is disabled and you suck, then you shouldn't be cast. <laughs> so as RJ said, you know, as RJ said, you got to be ready. When they come there, you got to be ready. You got to hone your talent. Two, like Becky said, I did create my own content. So my goal in life was to be on the daytime soap opera General Hospital, like most Muslim girls. And it didn't happen. And when, <laughs> and when it didn't happen, when I looked at TV, when I saw the people who looked like me, they were all comedians. So what I did was I became a comedian. And when I became a comedian in 2000, I've been doing this 17 years, it wasn't a big deal to be disabled because comedians, we're the rejects. We're the people who are too ugly to act. And we're like, yay, I'm the lost Kardashian. So I became, <laughs> so I became a comedian and it took off. I lucked out, you know, I got to tour the world as part of a tour called The Arabs Gone Wild. I got to be on Broadway, so on and so forth. And then I got to be a full-time contributor on Countdown with Keith Oberman. And up until that point, I had never been made fun of in my life, which is a really common occurrence for people with disabilities. They tend to be bullied. They tend to be shunned. I wasn't. I was like Little Miss Popular. I had never been made fun of. And when I started doing Countdown with Keith Oberman, all of America started making fun of me because of what we said about with RJ's character. My focus wasn't the fact that I had CP. We would be talking about politics. We would be talking, believe it or not, even back then about Donald Trump. This was 2012. And we weren't talking about my CP. So when I went online and saw the way that people were mocking me and saying, like, her mouth is so distracting. I want to pull it up. She looks like an honor killing gone wrong. You know, this, yeah, for, you know, all these things. I laughed my ass off. I, my favorite one. Poor Gumby Mouth terrorist whore, we should probably pray for her. I was like, yes, please do. So when I saw this, I realized that the absence of images of disability in media was creating a real fear and hatred in real life. And then I started seeing like, why isn't there a wheelchair Muppet? Like, why doesn't Dora the Explorer, she has Swiper, why isn't he lose an arm one day while he's stealing? So that kids are introduced to these images from a really young age. And I guess my final point of my manifesto tonight is yes, create your own content and then admit the fact that we're not all privileged and we usually can't make it. So I created my content and it took me seven years to find producers who were willing to cast a disabled lead. And I finally did and we can have a huge round of applause for my amazing producers, Hazy Mills. So. <laughs> Hazy Mills, which is Sean Hayes' company, 
is producing my comedy series, If I Can Can, and our goal is to show, um, it's called If I Can Can. And the goal is to show a mainstream character with a disability, something that we've never seen. You know, my character, I always say, we're only allowed to have three storylines. You either, it's either, you can't love me because I'm disabled, heal me, or kill me. Those are our choices. So my character, she's looking for love in all the wrong places. Her issues are not that she has cerebral palsy. Her issue is that she wants to be on Broadway, and she's not getting cast. That's her issue. And like, I also wanted to have a sassy disabled person, because we're always like snowflake happy angel babies. So like, my character cuts off a woman with no arms and flips her off, and is like, look what else I can do with my hands. And I just wanted to reflect our lives, to show something that was mainstream that everyone would want to watch. And what was so amazing is my producers are so, so supportive, but I had to fight because intersectionality. When you do see disability, it's white. It's skinny and it's pretty. So when I came in there, I was like, I also want to have a black disabled gay man. And they were like, no, that's too much disability, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I'm like, well, we are 20% of the population. And then, you know, we had to find a, a writer who was willing to write a Palestinian because apparently it's very controversial to be Palestinian. So my writer initially wrote me as Pakistani. Um, and now I'm the head writer. And so like, but that's my final point. My final point is we live in fear. What I hear from people all the time is, if I fight too hard, I'm not gonna get cast. If I fight too hard, my story will never be made. If I don't compromise, it's never gonna get to the screen. And I'm telling you, I fought for seven years. I put my foot down. I, I gave them the things that I didn't care about. I was like, oh, she's from Queens, not New Jersey, fine. She's Pakistani, not Palestinian, not so fine. You know, so you can, Fight for what you want. The market is there. The support is there. Don't be afraid. And when they say, no, it can't be done, show them why it can. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of fighting, uh, before I got my first job in the entertainment industry, I went on 100 interviews. So every time I walked in the door, people approached me with fear and didn't think that I was gonna do the job. And what ultimately worked is I went through a temporary placement agency that then put me in the room at Creative Artists Agency where I just started doing the job and started proving that I could do the job. Seven months later, they hired me full time and fortunately, that was the launch of my career. But speaking of that, I view interview, job interviews, the same way as I view auditions. People are going every day to auditions, and whenever the opportunity comes about, you're trying to give it your all, but you gotta just keep pushing, and we keep pushing at the union for opportunities for people to have the opportunity to just audition for the job. We can't tell employers who to hire exactly. We have 160,000 members we're advocating on behalf of, but we want people to have the opportunities, especially for roles that fit the description of who they are and who they can play. And along those lines, I want to bring up Danny Woodburn, who's going to tell us about the Ruderman TV challenge that we should all be supportive of. <laughs> Most of you know him as Mickey from Seinfeld. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to rain on all your parade right now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Becky. Um, I did want to uh, say a few things because it's pertinent to the Ruderman TV Challenge. And I'll tell you what that is real quickly. Uh, the Ruderman TV Challenge is uh, basically uh, the Ruderman Family Foundation, and you can find them at rudermanfamilyfoundation.org, is issuing a challenge to my industry. And people like myself, Marley Batlin, I know RJ is going to do a video for us, challenging uh, casting directors, writers, producers, directors to bring people with disabilities into the hiring place to attempt to at least audition us, see us, interview us. Becky talks about going on 100 interviews before she got her job. Now, that's an experience I've had in the past, too, looking for that other job while I try to make it in my industry. So when we talk about we talk about trying to make it and make our own vehicles. You know, we don't have the disabled actor as waiter like we have the actor as waiter. That's not as common an event because we don't have the same access to employment. 
And so that, we have it harder, we just do. Um, we talk about access to education. I know RJ, Mesun, we were talking about educate yourselves, preparedness has to meet opportunity, right? But we talk about education, Bill, did you, did you study in the theater? I did. You did, so you, you tread the boards, as it were. So treading the boards, when we think about that on Broadway, what kind of access do we have as performers to the stage? It's very limited compared to coming to the theater. Yes, they have to have seats for you, but if you want to come up on stage and work, that's a different thing. So the first person to sing in a Broadway show just happened last year, and that was Allie Stroker. She's a, a wheelchair user. She sang for Spring Awakening. Fantastic job, but she didn't have a dressing room. What? She didn't have a dressing room. So the Nederlander organization had to build her a dressing room. Wow. So organizations have to take it to the next level. They have to spend the money to get the money that is in our pockets. We have billions of dollars in discretionary funding. So when they say, oh, it costs too much, we need an assistant, we need this, we need to create a ramp, we have to have access to the stage, screw you. <laughs> Do it. As a producer, do it, and then you can have our money. We will come to your show. We will come to the theater. And so we talk about education access, preparedness. We have to have an understanding that we might not be able to get that opportunity because we can't get to the preparedness. We can't have the waiter job while we're still looking. All right, did I knock everybody down, Peg? Um, <laughs> I just want people to understand reality. This is a pep talk that these people are, are bringing to, to us. And we have, uh, we have people, decision makers here. That's an incredible thing. Decision makers have to hear this more often. They have to hear this discussion way more often. And I thank you, decision makers, for coming to this event, because it's so important to hear. And, and another thing is that, um, you know, we talk about things are getting better. Well, one year they get better, the next year they don't. May soon talked about the Ruderman Family Foundation. I co-authored the white paper that did that study um, on people with disabilities in television. And we see that it is cyclical. It's up and down, up and down. Whereas other minorities, it's always a steady climb. So what we need to do, please, go look at the videos, share the videos, get them out there, talk about this challenge. Even if you're not in the industry, just share it. Because somebody along the line might see this and say, okay, we're gonna bring that person in to be the neighbor next door, to be the pizza delivery person, to be the dental hygienist, because it's not just about authenticity of the disability, it's about authenticity of the people in the community, which is who we are, we're people in the community, and that's all we are, right? So thank you for your time, and thank you all for coming up here tonight, I appreciate it, thank you. And if anyone struggles to write a breakdown that they don't want to find offensive or needs to find resources for finding these performers with disabilities, please contact diversity at sagafter.org and we can help you. Uh, so we want to bring it to question. I want to thank everyone and maybe what you can think of just while we answer a few questions is a key takeaway, probably a quick one-liner from each of you on how we can continue this conversation and keep it going so we get to the 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, and don't keep having the same conversation every time we all get together. So, who has a question? <laughs> We do have a movie to see tonight, so it's only going to be yes. a couple. I'm sorry. Yes. I see a lot of hands. <laughs> For William H. Macy, on Shameless, there was a scene with disabled actors with Frank Gallagher. How many people did um, the Shameless casting people actually employ, and how much were those able-bodied? Uh, not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Not a clue. Um, it's, uh, let's not underestimate though, I, I have done this. I wrote some TV movies and uh, there was a young man with CP that I tried to, I wanted to do the part and it was on our budget, it just couldn't, I, I did it wrong. I should have started with the producers because I think there's money to be made and it was, would have been worth their while to put a person in a wheelchair in that role, but it was gonna cost us a lot of money. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I had to back down. It just wasn't gonna happen. I mean, it wasn't, 
it wasn't twice, it was 10 times what that role would have cost. And I'm wondering, um, I'm, I'm going to argue with you about uh, someone without a disability playing someone with a disability. I certainly wouldn't want you to be limited to playing people with disabilities. Um, I, I, um, I think there are probably, uh, your point is well taken. I totally get it. But uh, we do call it acting. And, um, and um, my friend Dave Mamet one time cast Joe Montaigne, who's an Italian, to do this thing uh, where he played a Jew who was having an a, a identity crisis. And in um, one of these Q&As, someone took him to task of casting an Italian to play uh, such a, a, a sensitive Jewish role. And Dave thought for a second, and he said, hmm, casting by religion, interesting idea. <laughs> and that was the end of that discussion. I would just like to say that there are some practical situations where um, if you want to present someone with a disability which is uh, profound, a person with that disability, I'm, I'm questioning whether that person could do the role. It's rough, as you well know. It's rough. I literally have an answer to every single point. No, I bet you so, do. <laughs> number one, when I say that we should play disabled roles, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thought of for roles that aren't written as disabled. And that goes for gender, and that goes for race. Mm -hmm. So if the role doesn't specify that it has to be a white woman, then maybe it could be a black man or a Latino. So when I say that we should play disabled roles, I'm not saying we should only play disabled roles. But my challenge to you is, would you play Michelle Obama? <laughs> and if you wouldn't play Michelle Obama, that's how I feel about visible disability. And the reason I say visible disability is because we have no way of knowing how many people with invisible disabilities are on our TV. But people would not consider Meryl Streep to play Oprah Winfrey. And they would, well, they did consider Scarlett you know, Johansson to play an Asian character, so I don't know what that's about. And Emma Stone is playing, you know, Rose Kennedy. But for, for me, I think, yes, acting is acting, but we wouldn't allow uh, Meryl Streep to play Barack Obama. So I don't think that we should allow yeah, non-wheelchair users to play wheelchair users. We don't cross the line with um, blackface anymore. No. And even though blackface and, and cripping up have a totally different history, the exploitation is really similar. And when you don't have an actual disabled person in that role, you're just not getting access to to what you need. Uh, different, different point. I, you may not be casting it as well as you could, but I'm, I'm a little nervous about, um, uh, would I play M Michelle Obama? Would you if I thought I could pull on? it off, yes. Would you put black, would. would you put black, William H. Macy. Would, you, Michelle would you put black face on your Obama. face? No, I wouldn't but, put. No. But if you wouldn't put black face on, then putting on a spasm or putting on a chair or putting on a cane to me is the same thing. That's just what the predominant number of people, we do this thing called Film This, and Film This is all about people with disabilities in performance that talk about why this is offensive. And we have to fight this all the time because the very first thing we're told is, we auditioned disabled people, but none of them were good enough. So the implication is we're never good enough. And then we hear about the financial thing, that's the one thing that I can understand. But the idea that we can't play a role I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. The first three years that we tried to do my sitcom, they were like, you can't handle an 18 hour day. You can't even stand up. You have to sit down after three minutes. How are you gonna handle an 18 hour day? And then I was like, well, I toured 280 days this year. I worked on a movie with Adam Sandler. I can do it. And they think that we can't. But I think that people like Micah Fowler and RJ Mitty and you know, Daryl Chill Mitchell are proving that we can do it. That's, that's just, I mean, it's yeah. something that we've really researched and looked into. Yeah, Christina? Sorry. 
start again. Okay. So, so one of the other things is that you have, when you think about, I understand what you're saying because everybody goes to, but it's called acting. Well, disability is not a technical skill. Thank you. It's a lived experience. And we have faced such a history of exclusion that if we continue that line of thinking, we're going to continue to be excluded in the industry. And that's part of the reason for, yes, did you do a beautiful job? Absolutely. Did Daniel Day Lewis do a beautiful job? Absolutely. But by the same token, why couldn't a person with a disability that might be less profound than the character that they might be playing play that person with a more profound disability? Why is that different than a non disabled person playing a disabled person? It's got to, we've got to look at it as trying to create a level playing field before we open up the whole thing to everybody. I, before I know, we have white actors playing Othello. I know right. we need to get on to the next question, but what Mr. Macy said earlier about, about giving them a reason not, about not giving them a reason not to cast you. I, I work with a lot of youth. I've been working, I, I did a lot of acting classes when I was younger. I did a, like uh, teaching with professional teachers. I saw a lot of kids come through the door that are disabled, they just don't have it. I hate to tell half of you, <laughs> you don't have the talent. It, it, it's sad, it's sad to say. I'm sa I, and you do have talents, but just not towards that. Try lighting, try different things. There's a lot of different atmospheres in this that everyone wants to be an actor. Everyone once upon a time wanted to be an actor. I don't work in the film industry. If I relied on my talents as an actor, I would probably be homeless yeah. more often than not. And you, you need to be trained. You need to not give them an excuse not to hire you. And they're going to look for an excuse. They don't want to pay you. They don't want you to be hired. They want to hire someone that has a million Instagram followers, six million Twitter followers. They don't want to even hire people that are good <laughs> talent. Like, All right, we got we got to just it's, it's wrap funny. it up. But um, I think just the overall up. underlying theme is ask questions, don't make assumptions. We all have different lived experiences and include more people with disabilities across the board because we're 20% of the population in the US and anyone can join our population at any point in their lives so they might as well be a part of the community. Thank you all. Thank you. I, I first of all want to wanna thank um, Becky. Um, for managing this, uh, this, um, this crew here. Um, it's, of course, a fascinating conversation that's been going on here, and we are really looking to take this to the next level. And I want to thank all of you for supporting this cause by even just being here, by, by, by making a statement, by coming to Real Abilities. I want you to know Real Abilities is not an easy sell, and it's only thanks to you people that we're getting a little bit more attention and bringing more attention to this topic. So thank you. Thank you. I want to give a big thank you also to the Eurasia Foundation. Um, uh, we're part of their social expertise exchange, and that's how RJ is here with us. Thank you, folks. New territory. I don't underestimate what I'm And now, guys, there's still a movie. <laughs> um, it's an amazing movie tonight that I think will really highlight everything that was discussed here, and you heard a little bit about it in the panel. Um, and I want to bring up one of um, our our um, uh, committee members who helped select this film, um, who will be leading the Q&A also after the film. She's an actress, she's a performer, and um, she's really one of the biggest activists in this field, Anita Hollander. My name is Anita Hollander. I've been an actress for 53 years, and 35 years of those, I've done it on one leg. I've worked in theater, I've worked in television and movies and, um, and dance, a dance company. And I, I'm the national chair of SAG-AFTRA Performers with Disabilities Committee, on which we have members like RJ Mitty and Danny Woodburn, who's my vice chair, and plus a man you're about to see in the movie coming up, Michael Patrick Thornton on our committee. A year ago, I was performing at the Goodman Theater, and right up the road at Steppenwolf, 
uh, Michael Patrick Thornton was playing Richard III, and I was able to like steal away from the Goodman up to see him do one of the most extraordinary performances of Richard III I have ever seen, and I don't think anybody will ever top it, not Olivier, not Gilgood, nobody. Um, I'm so glad you're going to get to see Michael Patrick Thornton tonight. Now, here's the thing. As a person, I 